American Perspectives continues now with Jerome Brook. The executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute spoke recently about Israel and the Middle East conflict. This event took place at the University of Pennsylvania in April. It runs about an hour and 45 minutes. Plenty of time to ask questions in the question and answer period following the lecture. We ask the introductory comments be brief, out of courtesy to the speaker and to others in the audience waiting, waiting to ask questions. We have circulated index cards for those who wish to write down their question. And now, I would like you to join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Jerome Brook. Thank you, Evan. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks all. Thank you all for coming. As military operations in Iraq wind down, we're hearing an increasing chorus of pundits, both American and Arab, calling for the Bush administration to next devote its efforts to resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Indeed, the administration itself has chosen, as this time, to launch its so-called roadmap uh, for the solution of this issue. The idea is that by pressuring Israel to compromise, America is going to win friends in the Muslim world at a time when so many are angry at the United States over Iraq. According to the pundits, it is America's support of Israel that has caused many in the Arab world to hate us and motivated them to commit acts of terrorism against us. The hatred, some add, is, after all, justified because America has been unfair in its dealings with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We have sent Israelis aid, sold them weapons, which they use to victimize the Arab population. We have been helping Israelis oppress the Palestinians, they claim, and for these sins, we are feeling the retribution of the Muslim world. Now, paradoxically, to some extent, this view is correct. But for reasons other than those given by the critics of US policy. I would argue that America has not done enough to support Israel. America has been half-hearted in supporting its ally. And that is one reason why we have been targeted by terrorists. Essentially, with every helping hand it offered to Israel, America has simultaneously undercut the Israelis. Since 1967, America's support of Israel has followed a consistent pattern. America has befriended Israel, offered it aid, expertise, money, and helped it become strong in the face of its would-be destroyers. Yet, it has time and time again pressured, no, I'd say blackmailed, Israel to back down, to make concessions, to compromise on principles with its Arab neighbors and with the Palestinians. Of course, Europe and much of the rest of the world have since 1967 become increasingly hostile to Israel and increasingly sympathetic to Israel's enemies. The West is in the process of abandoning its one bastion of Western civilization in the Middle East. By weakening Israel, America and the West have betrayed their short-sighted, unprincipled approach to foreign policy. I will argue that it is in America's own self-interest, morally and practically, to support Israel against its Arab and Palestinian enemies. Now, indeed, the moral and the practical are in life in harmony, as applied to this conflict and really in every aspect of life. The immoral is indeed impractical. It just doesn't work. Thus, no practical solution to this conflict is possible divorced from morality. This conflict cannot be understood and no solution proposed without identifying the moral character of each party and treating that party according to what they deserve based on that 
moral characterization. Therefore, I want to step back from the endless newspaper headlines and dig deeper into this conflict. I want to begin by asking a few questions about the conflict itself. Who is in the right? Who is in the wrong? Whom should America support? In my view, we should support Israel. Because in this conflict, Israel has right on its side. It is the moral side. Israel is acting in self-defense, and any pressure on it to compromise is pressure on the good to compromise with evil, pressure on a friend to take just a little bit of poison. The Arabs and the Palestinians, I will argue, are in the wrong, and we should not support the establishment of a Palestinian state. You will see that by compelling Israel to compromise with its enemies, America has made this conflict worse, not better, and has emboldened in the process militant Islam to strike against us. The so-called peace process can lead only to more violence in Israel and to war elsewhere. Since the Oslo Agreement, Israel has suffered greatly for its overtures of peace. But America, and by extension the West, are also suffering and will continue to suffer as long as Israel is viewed in the Arab world as weak. America's self-defense is intimately connected with that of Israel. It is right and proper for us to side with the Israelis. If we don't, we will be fanning the flames and inviting further aggression. As the commentator Daniel Pipes wrote well before September 11th, quote, Israel's perceived weakness is now an American problem, and the aggressive euphoria being expressed by the Arab-speaking masses poses a direct danger to the United States, unquote. We saw the magnitude of that danger on September 11th. So let us now look at some of the history behind this conflict. In this conflict, I want to ask, as I said, who is right? In essence, does Israel have a right to exist? Yes, without question. Now let me be clear. Israel's right to exist has nothing to do with ancient or biblical history. It has nothing to do with religious or so-called collective rights. There is no such thing as collective rights, Jewish, Palestinian, or any other. Israel's right to exist lies in that Israel created itself out of nothing. Its founders created a free country in a region dominated by totalitarian, corrupt regimes. Israel's right to exist is based on its moral standing as a free nation. Now, when the first Jewish immigrants came to Palestine, it was a barren and uncivilized place. As Mark Twain, who visited Palestine in 1867, wrote, Palestine was a, quote, desolate country whose soil is rich enough but is given over wholly to weeds. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with a pomp of life and action. There was hardly a tree or shrub anywhere, even the olive and the cactus. Those fast fens of the worthless soil had almost deserted the country." Unquote. Indeed, at the end of the 19th century, the population in Palestine was sparse, swamps were everywhere, and over half the territory was desert. The new immigrants bought land, and on that land, they built cities. They dried swamps, and they cultivated desert. They brought in irrigation, grew crops, and in general, conquered nature for their own means. They reclaimed land. They built villas, swimming pools, and modern sanitation. They built universities, opera houses, and theaters. 
to an area of nomadic tribes and subsistence farmers, the Jews brought industry, libraries, hospitals, art galleries, higher education, and the rule of law. In short, they brought Western civilization to a Mideastern hellhole. They transformed Palestine from a backward and sparsely populated piece of land into a thriving, relatively Western, civilized place. Like 19th century homesteaders in the American West, Israel's founders earned the right to the land. They supported themselves. They created a society in which life was not merely a struggle for substance, but one in which men could live in freedom and prosper. It was a society, despite some flaws, that built the foundations that protected and sustained human life. Thus, in essence, it was a moral society. Now, what was the reaction of the inhabitants of the area who witnessed Israel's flowering? How did the Arabs of the Middle East respond? For the most part, with violence. Instead of thanking these new inhabitants for the economic prosperity and political freedom that they brought, for the hospitals and universities that they built, from very early on, the Arabs harassed, attacked, and tried to rid the land of these new immigrants. Now, you might suppose that they had legitimate grievances, such as the widely believed story that Israelis who came to Palestine before 1948, the year Israel was founded, displaced the Arab population. Well, this indeed is false. Israelis bought the land that they developed or settled on unclaimed land. Indeed, before Israel's founding in 1948, there was an influx of Arabs into Palestine. They were drawn there by the unmatched jobs and standard of living, generally by the economic opportunities available in the developing new state. With the drying of the swamps, the establishment of utilities, and the building of hospitals, in addition to employment opportunities, the general quality of life of the Arab population improved, and with it, there was a significant increase in life expectancy within the Arab population. To the extent that the Arab population in Israel has been willing to accept the values that these Westerners brought with them, they have thrived and succeeded. The material evidence of this is visible in the relatively high standard of living to be found in many Arab villages, and by the fact that many Arabs, when they return from visiting their relatives in Egypt or Syria or Jordan, bless Allah for being born in Israel. These Arabs are far freer in Israel than in any other or any Arab country. They vote, they serve in parliament, even in the cabinet. Some serve in the Israeli army, fighting to preserve their freedoms. Yet, this makes no difference to the rest of the Arab world. In spite of being offered a Palestinian state as part of the United Nations resolution that established Israel, the Palestinians joined the armies of seven Arab states in war, invading Israel the day it declared its independence in May of 1948. Since then, Israel has been under constant attack from its Arab neighbors. It fought five bloody wars, all in self-defense. Given that the Arabs are far better off as Israeli citizens than in any other Mideastern country, given that they have no real objective historical grievance against Israel, why do they not try and emulate Israel's success instead of attacking her? What is their motivation? Now, when a person sees that a different culture can produce a much better life, greater knowledge, greater mastery over nature, greater comfort and security, greater respect for the individual, then his own culture, that person has two choices. 
He can adopt the new culture as a blessing, or he can seek to destroy it and ultimately himself. The Arabs are guilty of what Ayn Rand called, quote, hatred of the good for being the good. As she wrote in another context, quote, they do not want to own your fortune. They want you to lose it. They do not want to succeed. They want you to fail. They do not want to live. They want you to die, unquote. As the commentator Ed Locke writes, the Palestinians, quote, hate the Israelis not because of their vices, but because of their virtues, their ability to better their lives by embracing reason, science, technology, and individual rights. Israel, despite its own growing crop of religious mystics, represents the triumph of secularism and freedom in the Middle East. Israel stands for the principle of progress, stands for the principle of life itself. Now this is what makes Israel a moral country. It's pro-life, pro-freedom, pro-reason, essential nature. And this is also the reason that it is hated. Now according to the ethics of Ayn Rand's philosophy, the philosophy of objectivism. A good man who's, is one who lives by the guidance of reason. He lives for the sake of his own happiness, achieving his ends by his own effort, neither sacrificing himself to others, nor others to himself. A moral state, a moral country, is one that protects a man's rights to pursue his own ends that secures his freedom to act and protects his property. A country that offers this, a country that enables men, Arabs, Jews, all men to thrive is indeed a moral country. In essential terms, Israel is such a country and therefore has a moral right to exist. Yet many in the Arab world and the Palestinians, particularly the Arab leadership and the Arab intellectuals, have hated these Westerners and the values they represented from the day they appeared in Palestine. They objected, as they still do today, to the very formation of an Israeli state. Although the Arabs are the aggressors, they portray themselves as the victims. Now, I say no. Regardless of its victories, Israel is in the right. It is the victim. It has always been the target of aggression. The wars it has waged and the territories it has conquered uh, were all acts of self-defense. But the problem here is not merely that the Arabs claim to be the victims. It is that America like many other countries, accepts that Israel and her aggressors are morally equal. That in this conflict, both sides have legitimacy. Now, I have argued that Israel is the moral party, that as a state that protects individual rights and freedom, it alone is entitled to invoke a right to exist. American foreign policy should reflect that fact. Now, while Israel's right to exist and its position as a moral country are valid, in the interest of objectivity, I would say that I have certain reservations regarding Israel. As I mentioned, there is no such thing as collective rights to a state. And as a consequence, it's a mistake for Israel to long-term identify itself and consider itself a Jewish state. Indeed, Israel's biggest flaw is the lack of complete separation between state and religion. In addition, its socialistic policies violate the individual rights of its own citizens and have driven many Israelis to leave the country and, of course, held it back economically. However, these detriments by no means undercut Israel's value as a country or the morality 
and righteousness of their position in the Middle East. This is especially true when compared to their neighbors. Now, given this as a context, how should we view the Palestinians and the claims that they, not the terrorized Israelis, are the victims? Well, let's consider the evidence. Are they the victims? What can be said of the his supposed historical grievances against Israel? Despite their claims that they are victims of a Zionist plot to strip them of their land, the Palestinians were the aggressors in the, 1990, in the 1948 war. They turned down the offer to establish their own state alongside Israel, a larger state than that which they now demand for themselves. Rejecting the offer, they opted to join Israel's enemies in the goal of erasing it from the map. When the Arab armies invaded Israel in May of 1948, the Palestinians joined them. At the time, what they saw was not the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. What they sought was the complete destruction of Israel. A Secretary General of the Arab League, Azam Fasha, made clear in 1948, quote, the Arabs intend to conduct a war of extermination and momentous massacre, which will be spoken of like the Mongolian massacres and the Crusades, unquote. So the fact that there is no Palestinian state today is not the fault of the Israelis. Rather, by rejecting the offer of establishing a state in 1948 and then initiating force against Israel, the Arabs negated whatever rights they had to a state. Now, what about the claims that the Palestinians were displaced, turned into refugees by the Israelis? Well, the large majority of Palestinians fled out of fear of the violence their own leaders were initiating. Many, particularly the community leaders, the rich, and the intellectuals, fled before any hostilities began. It was not necessarily the Jews they feared, but the conflict itself. In some cases, Palestinians left their home because of coercion of their own leadership. And while Israel did occasionally drive up small numbers of Palestinians, this was due primarily to unplanned military considerations and was an act of self-defense. The dominant attitude among Palestinians at the time was that they had been victims of their own leadership who had deserted them and had promised them a quick return home rather than victims of Israeli hostility. As the historian Yoshua Porat writes, quote, the 1948 war was launched by the Arabs who rejected the United Nations partition solution. Those who began the war are responsible for its consequences, including the expulsion of Arabs from places where their continued presence could have constituted a mortal danger to the young state of Israel fighting for its very survival." Unquote. Also note that Israel offered to take back 100,000 Palestinian refugees in 1949, but that offer was rejected by the Arab states. Since then, these same Arab countries have done nothing to help these refugees. They have treated them poorly and used their existence as a public relations and political tool. If the Palestinians had accepted the founding of two states in Palestine, or if they had not fled their homes, no refugee problem would have arisen. Indeed, the Jewish leadership based all of their ensuing decisions on the assumption that the Palestinians would remain equal citizens of the new state of Israel. As David Ben-Gurion, who would go on to be Israel's first prime minister, told the leadership of his party in 1947, quote, in our state there will be non-Jews as well as Jews, and all of them will be equal citizens, equal in everything without exception. That is, the state will be theirs as well, unquote. 
So by looking back at history, we see that the Arabs have been the aggressors. They have been the initiators of force. But some people argue that that was the past and the Palestinians have suffered enough, that they have changed and that they now deserve their own state. Well, let's go back to the evidence. In what way have they changed? Do they now recognize the right of Israel to exist? Have they accepted the fact that the initiation of force is not a means of negotiating? Absolutely not. The Palestinians have chosen the worst, most lowly form of violence to pursue their cause, indiscriminate terrorism. And for their leaders, they have chosen some of the, some of the bloodiest terrorists in history. Yasser Arafat and the PLO have a long history of terrorism and violence. Over a span of 35 years, Arafat and the PLO have been responsible for the deaths of thousands of Israeli, American, Lebanese, and Palestinian civilians. Arafat has orchestrated the kidnapping and murder of Israeli schoolchildren, the hijacking of airliners, countless car bombings, and death squad killings. In recent years, Arafat has been using Hamas and Islamic Jihad as the arms of terrorism, while he has pretended to be a peacemaker. Every Israeli compromise has been met with more and more violence. Violence used as a tool to pressure Israel to make even more concessions. Indeed, a Palestinian state under current conditions spells doom for Israel because any such state would only serve as a beachhead for terrorist activities against Israel. Arafat's ultimate goal is not a small Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. Arafat aims at the whole of Israel. A Palestinian state is just the first step. The desire of the Palestinian leadership not to make peace with Israel and indeed to erase it from the map is made further evident when one listens to the radio stations sanctioned by the Palestinian Authority or when one reads the textbooks from which Palestinian children are being taught. As the commentator Daniel Pipes has observed, quote, school curricula, camp activities, TV programming, and religious indoctrination all portray Israelis in a Nazi-style way, as subhuman beings worthy of killing, unquote. As illustration, in a televised public sermon in June of 2001, a Palestinian religious leader declared, quote, God willing, this unjust state of Israel will be erased. This unjust state of the United States will be erased, unquote. It is well documented that the textbooks in Palestinian schools are filled with vile anti-Semitism. They are also filled with a rejection of any legitimacy for the state of Israel and that to quote such a book, there is no alternative to destroying Israel, unquote. Or in a fifth grade Arabic language text, quote, remember the final and inevitable result will be the victory of the Muslims over the Jews, unquote. And on a popular children's TV show, on Palestinian TV, a little girl sings in Arabic, Quote, oh, sing my sister constantly about my life as a suicide warrior, unquote. As a teacher cheers on, bravo, bravo. Now these are just a few of the many, many examples of the fierce hatred with which the Palestinian schools indoctrinate their youth. No surprise that Hamas and Islamic Jihad have an easy time finding young Palestinians willing to give up their lives to make these ideas come true. Thus, there's every reason to believe that the Palestinian leadership views a state in the West Bank and Gaza as just one more step 
towards the complete annihilation of Israel. Indeed, Arafat himself has repeatedly said to his own people that any compromise with Israel is just one step towards the ultimate goal of an Arab-Palestinian state that will take Israel's place. His continued sponsorship and use of terrorism and rejection of any deals offered him, I think, prove his ultimate aim. By choosing the road of violence against peaceful, free countries the, and preaching the virtues of violence to young Palestinians, Arafat and his regime have forfeited any claim, any legitimacy that they might have had to a country of their own. Only a sick and cynical world could grant such a man the Nobel Peace Prize. But some say this is all a result of the occupation. If given a state of their own, things would be different. Well, what can we expect if the Palestinians have their own sovereign state? Can we expect a peace-loving, freedom-loving Palestinian country? Will it share the West's respect for individual rights, the individual rights of its own citizens? If so, maybe there's still some hope. Well, let's consider the track record of the current Palestinian Authority, the temporary governing body of Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Arafat is indeed the dictator of the, these areas and everything but title. Palestinians live in constant fear of having their property arbitrarily confiscated by Arafat's corrupt police force. Laws prohibiting free speech are common and are enforced brutally. To silence those who oppose him, Arafat shuts down radio and TV stations. Indeed, Palestinian media that was free to express itself under Israeli rule is now forced to tow Arafat's party line. When Palestinian journalists stray, they are detained, tortured, and sometimes murdered. Hundreds of dissenters of all stripes have suffered such a fate under Arafat's regime. A few months ago, the media finally focused on another form of barbarism that Palestinian authorities are engaged in, the torture and murder of so-called collaborators. Just a few months ago, a middle-aged mother of six and her niece were brutally tortured and murdered by the authorities for supposedly collaborating with Israel. How did they know that the women were collaborators? Because a relative, again under extreme torture, accused these two women. This has been going on for over 10 years in both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, where even selling land to a Jew is reason for execution. Arafat's current regime is barbaric and oppressive. One can logically predict the conditions in an independent Palestinian state would be even worse, since they will not be the focal point of international attention as they are right now. Now viewed in this context of dictatorial rule, the alleged right of the Palestinians to self-determination is groundless. No group has a right to its own state if what it seeks is a dictatorship. Arafat's Palestinian self-determination really means more of Arafat's despotism. It means granting legitimacy to a state that is utterly hostile to its own citizens. As Ayn Rand wrote, quote, the right of the self-determination of nations applies only to free societies or to societies seeking to establish freedom. It does not apply to dictatorships, unquote. The only legitimate reason to found a new state is to escape tyranny and secure freedom. Thus, America's founding fathers rightly fought for independence from England's oppressive rule. The United States was founded on the recognition of individual rights. 
A country's right to exist as a separate political entity is derived from the individual rights of its citizens. A regime like that in Iraq, for example, and much of the Middle East, unfortunately, that denies its own citizens their individual rights has no right to exist itself. What Palestinians desire is, is the right to be rightless serfs in a state run by a ruthless dictator. Now, nobody has a right to create and maintain such a state. Palestinians would be better off staying under Israeli rule, as some Palestinians will admit when they feel safe to do so. Under Israeli rule, their rights are protected to a much greater extent than they would under the Palestinian Authority's authoritarian regime. Indeed, Palestinians rely on the relative economic freedom and prosperity offered in Israel to make their living. They protest whenever Israel closes its borders because they are out of work. In contrast to what has been achieved in Israel, the Palestinians have created very little of their own, not under Jordanian rule pre-1967 and not since. Now, Israel also offers Palestinians more precious values than merely economic ones. What Arab country gives its inhabitants the liberty to protest, to publish articles and books opposing the government, as many Jews and Arabs do in Israel? What Arab country has free elections or a judicial system in which all are treated equally before the law? In what Arab country can so-called occupied people rely on the law and protest their fate all the way up to the Supreme Court as those Palestinians under Israeli control still can. None, not a single Arab country. In Israel, Palestinians have more freedom, more economic opportunities than they have in any other Arab country. And they, that, and that they could possibly have in a future Palestinian state. If the choice is between a Palestinian state run by terrorists like Arafat and remaining under Israeli rule, the latter is by far the better option for the Palestinians. Now, if the Palestinians were serious about having their own state, their own free state, they would start by deposing and arresting Yasser Arafat for his crimes against his own people. In place of the terrorists now representing them, Palestinians should send to the negotiating table representatives who believe in and honor individual rights, leaders who plan to establish a free, civilized country where violence is abhorred and suppressed. Palestinians should treat Israel as an older and wiser neighbor from whom they have much to learn, rather than as an enemy to be destroyed. Only when Palestinians are willing to negotiate with Israel on such terms will they have earned the right to a state of their own. Now, given this background information, it should be no surprise, I think, that the peace process has been such a complete disaster. Just as the moral is practical, so the immoral is impractical. And at the heart of the peace process is the immoral premise that there is a moral equivalence between Israel and her enemy. But as we have seen, Israel and the Palestinians are not moral equals. Israel is in the right. The Palestinians are the aggressors. And any compromise between good and evil means bleeding the good to feed the evil. Any compromise between Israel and the Palestinians hurts Israel and emboldens the radical militant forces within the Palestinians. Although the land for peace doctrine, which is the essence of the peace process, seems to offer a mutually advantageous settlement, 
It is a deception. A necessary condition for peace is the cessation of Arab violence, particularly terrorism. But to attain it, to attain the cessation of violence, Israel is supposed to surrender territories crucial to its continued security. Territories that were won in a war instigated by Arab countries in 1967. To attain land, however, the Arabs are supposed to concede nothing. They need only withdraw the use of force. Like any aggressor, they are in essence holding Israel hostage. And like any victim, Israel, by paying the ransom, gains no value than they did not already have a right to. The implication of such a trade, land for peace, sanctioned by both America and Israel over the last 30 years, implicit in this idea is that Israel is in the wrong, that Israel is the aggressor and owes restitution to its Arab neighbors. If Israel is in the right, why must it concede? Israel won the contested land in a war of self-defense. So why should it give it back? Far from securing peace, compromises only weaken Israel and embolden its enemies. When Nazi Germany was appeased in 1938 by being allowed to claim Czechoslovakia as part of the Aryan people's homeland, an earlier version of land for peace, the result was to encourage Hitler to start a world war. America and Israel must recognize that peace cannot be achieved by surrendering to those who are relentlessly opposed to the existence of the state of Israel and who are hostile to the value of freedom in Israel and for that matter in their own countries. 30 years of the land for peace doctrine have left Israel with at best a cold peace with some of its neighbors, but also it has left it vulnerable to Arab hostility. Hatred of Israel has increased along with a decrease in the respect it once engendered. This process has accelerated since the beginning of the Oslo peace process in 1993. Indeed, since Arafat's, since Arafat's return to the West Bank and Gaza in 1994, Israel has seen nothing but an intensification of the violence and hatred against it. And what was the Palestinians' response to the complete capitulation of the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak in Camp David, where Alfred was offered a Palestinian state on 97% of the land that he demanded? Well, since then, Israel has been in a state of undeclared war. Its six million civilians have suffered over 12,500 terrorist attacks. They have buried more than 500 victims, a per capita death toll that is more than six times that of September 11th. The escalation of violence is the consequence of dealing, negotiating, compromising with terrorists. It is a consequence of rewarding violence. It is the consequence of the peace process. Since Oslo, Israel has appeared and acted weak. It has dealt with the Palestinians with kit gloves. It withdrew in humiliating fashion from Lebanon. And it has shown ever weakening moral assuredness in its cause. How many last opportunities has Israel given Yasser Arafat? How many times has it sworn to end Palestinian terrorism. Israel's concessions, Israel's weakness, rather than discouraging hostility, have indeed made the conflict worse and have brought Israel much harm. Now much of this harm, indeed much of the compromise, much of the appeasement, has been at the urging of Israel's so-called ally, the United States. Now, there's a, there is a whole history of America pressuring Israel to concede, to compromise, to withdraw when it should not have. A whole history 
of the U.S. harming Israel's interests. Now, you can ask me about this history in the Q&A. I just want to focus on the last decade or so. In recent times, it was America that prompted Israel to begin negotiating with Arafat in 1993. And since then, it has pressured Israel to give more and more, culminating in the complete Israeli capitulation in Camp David two years ago. And over the last two years, every time Israel acts in self-defense against the Palestinian Authority, it is the Bush administration that keeps holding them back and forcing them to retreat. This in spite of the fact that after every such retreat, terrorism spikes. It is outrageous that in the midst of its own war on terrorism, the U.S. is forcing Israel to negotiate and compromise with terrorists. In spite of the fact that when Israel is tough, terrorism against it declines, America continues to rebuke Israel when it acts in self-defense. Note how the, how the U.S. has pressured Israel into withdrawing from Arafat's compound twice during the last year. Or notice the scandal about six, nine months ago over Israel's assassination of the Hamas terrorist leader Salah Shadeda. The Palestinian Authority refused to arrest him, even though he was responsible for organizing and funding suicide bombings. The scale of his evil is comparable to that of bin Laden. As Israel rightly pointed out, this, quote, military action against one of the most dangerous Hamas terrorist leaders was a justified action of self-defense, unquote. The day after the bombing, which also killed uh, 14 civilians, Israel called the mission a success. President Bush, however, sharply condemned it as heavy-handed and a barrier to peace. Bush was not alone in this condemnation. Echoing him were the leaders of Europe, the UK included, and the UN General Secretary. The British called it unacceptable and counterproductive. 48 hours later, Israel issued a mealy-mouthed apology for the attack. Now that, I submit, is not the face of a country certain of its moral right to defend itself. Nor is such criticism from the United States the action of a true ally. Now, not only is America doing an enormous injustice to Israel, but it is also committing an enormous injustice to its own citizens. By weakening Israel, America has damaged its own national self-interest. America has been propping up regimes around the Middle East that have supported terrorism and supported anti-American actions. Until recently, it has done nothing in response to Islamic terrorism against U.S. interests. And how could it when for years it has been telling Israel that it had no right to do the same? The U.S. has sacrificed its Western ally, the one island of civilization in the Middle East, in the name of what? in the name of appeasement, in the name of short-term gain. America has hoped for decades that if it is nice to the Arabs, they will support us. They have hoped that by pressuring Israel, by arming the Egyptians, the Saudis, and the Jordanians, they will gain friends in the Middle East. They hoped that all this would secure the oil supply and reduce the threat of terrorism. All well, this has all failed, as September 11th proved. Yet we continue to indicate our interest in trying to buy Arab sympathy with Israeli blood. The tragic fact is that America's relationship with Israel indeed made September 11th possible. Evident in our advice to Israel, in our advocacy of the peace process, in our endless calls for Israel to appease its enemies, evident in America's action is our own moral weakness. Bin Laden had ample evidence to believe that the United States would not retaliate in significant fashion. After all, haven't we for decades told Israel to appease terrorists? 
If Arafat, the father of international terrorism, could be invited to the White House, what would America possibly do to its own terrorists? If America stopped Israel from retaliating against Arafat, how could it morally justify retaliating against its terrorists? If Israel is unjustified in assassinating a Hamas terrorist leader, how can America justify assassinating its terrorist nemesis? Now this hypocrisy, this double standard, has only weakened America's moral confidence in its war on terrorism and emboldened its enemies. American pressure on its Western ally to compromise and appease can be interpreted in only one way. That it, America, holds compromise and appeasement as supreme. That if attacked, it is likely to negotiate rather than retaliate. Indeed, just as we forbid Israel to retaliate against terrorist attacks, so, again, until very recently, we have done nothing in response to Islamic terrorism against the United States. September 11th was not the first terrorist act against America. Do you recall what we did in retaliation for the attacks on the USS Cole, or the US embassies in Kinsey and Tanzania, or the US soldiers in the uh, barracks in Saudi Arabia, or the attack on the World Trade Center in 1993, or the Pan Am Flight 103, or the 244 Marines who died in Beirut in a suicide bombing in 1983? Do you recall what we did? Well, probably you don't because we didn't do anything. Bush's announcement after September 11th and again this week that he supports a Palestinian state and that he supports the roadmap further undermines his credibility in the fight on terrorism. How can he, on one hand, reward an arch-terrorist and create a new terrorist-sponsoring country, and on the other hand, claim to seek the eradication of terrorism from the world? This hypocrisy is not missed on the Arab world or by people like bin Laden. A year ago, President Bush proclaimed an ultimatum to the world. Either you're with us or you're with the terrorists. Although Israel is clearly with us, we have all too often treated it as if it were against us. America, its critics say, owes September 11th to its support of Israel. Yes, America's short-sighted, unprincipled support of Israel has in fact done untold harm to Israel and untold harm to America's interests. Our failing was that we did not provide Israel, the true victim of this conflict, with enough support. Our failing was that we were moral cowards. We feared declaring one side of the conflict good and the other side evil. Now, being moral cowards in politics means that we counsel and practice appeasement towards our enemies. Terrorists can sense our weakness. That they struck us is no Surprise, our failings have invited such attacks. Now, there is no such thing as the peace process. Peace cannot be achieved by the just compromising with its enemies. Peace requires that the perpetrator of violence, the initiator of force, stop all acts of aggression and prove over time and with unequivocal evidence that it has truly forsaken violence as a means for achieving its goals. Only then, only when violence has ceased, can peace be discussed. Every attempt in history to circumvent this requirement has landed in disaster. If America is serious about its war on terrorism, and its desire for peace in Israel, it must take decisive action to reverse the mistakes that have been made over the last few decades. The U.S. must make it clear that it does not view Israel and its Arab neighbors as morally equal. Israel is a free, western, and peaceful state. As such, 
It is America's only true ally in a region dominated by despotism. Only Israel shares America's values and can be counted on in a true crisis. The quality of our alliances with Saudi Arabia and Egypt, for example, is being made clear now during this current crisis. These are regimes we cannot trust. They have and are turning a blind eye to Islamic terrorism against the West, and in some cases are actually financing this terrorism. In the name of both what is right and what is practically necessary, America's moral evaluation must be made explicit and clear. The U.S. must allow and encourage Israel to destroy Palestinian terrorism once and for all. There must be no further concessions, no discussions with Arafat and other Palestinian terrorists. America should also make sure that Israel maintains its military superiority in the region. This can be achieved by eliminating the military assistance that America provides Arab countries like Egypt. It is important to the U.S. that Israel be perceived by the Arab world as strong, indestructible, and supported 100% by the United States. It must be made clear to the Arab states and to the Palestinians that they must reconcile themselves to the very existence of Israel, that they must stop all acts of hostility and show a real intention for peace. The onus must be put on the aggressors to show that their intentions are real. Thus, the onus must be put on the Arab states. Ultimately, a strong, confident Israel is vital to U.S. interest in the Middle East. It is crucial to our fight against terrorism, to the elimination of unconventional weapons in the hands of despots like Saddam Hussein, and to the protection of the flow of oil to the West. America's unequivocal support of Israel will send a message that we support our allies in deeds, not just in words, that we support the Western values that our allies share with us. More fundamentally, by supporting our allies on principle, we broadcast loudly that we oppose terrorism absolutely on principle and in action. But it is not enough for America to rely on Israel, especially after September 11th. America needs to continue asserting itself in the Middle East. A U.S. that unequivocally supports Israel and pursues its own self-interest confidently and forcefully in the Middle East will actually gain respect in the Arab world. It will be perceived as a power that should not be fooled with. It will show the world that we are committed to the values of Western civilization and that we will defend them to our last breath, and that we will not yield on those values. Such uncompromising commitment to freedom and to Western values is the most powerful weapon we possess. Now, ultimately, peace will come to the Arab world, to the Middle East, only when they adopt Western values. The values of reason, individual rights, and freedom. Until the Arab populace is free, free of political enslavement by their own governments, and free from the mysticism of Islamic fundamentalism, no peace is going to be possible. Only when the Arab world experiences the equivalent of the Enlightenment, a rediscovery of reason, will it rise above its Middle Ages culture. Whether they like it or not, the solution to Arab poverty, to Arab political plight, to Arab frustration is the West and what it represents, not the West's destruction, as Bin Laden would suggest, but the West's victory, the adoption of the West by the East. 
But for this to happen, we in the West must first believe in our own values. If we continue to reject our own Western heritage, we can expect little from the rest of the world. A rediscovery, a renaissance of reason is first needed here. We must rediscover our values and reignite the just pride we once had in them. The future of the world depends on it. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Brooke. We'll now have about 45 minutes for Q&A, and I'll just come around with the microphone. So go ahead and stand up if you have a question, and I'll get to you. First one's always the hardest. Who's standing? Oh, raise your hand. I am. Oh, OK, you're standing for a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There is no such thing as collective rights. But there is also no such thing as collective guilt. Suppose there is an individual, a man of the mind, born among the Palestinians. What are his rights? Unfortunately, whether we like it or not, an individual born in a totalitarian regime or born to leaders that, are, um, that violate his rights will suffer from that violation. Uh, somebody born into Nazi Germany, whether it was Jewish or otherwise, is going to suffer the consequence of, Nazi, of the Nazis, of Hitler's regime, both from the Nazis and from Western bombing of German cities. And moral people, somebody moral who lives in Palestine, who's completely rational, would seek the annihilation of the Palestinian Authority. Somebody in that position would seek to move to Israel if they could, or to move to the West to the extent that they can. Israel will admit him under certain circumstances, absolutely. Um, but more fundamentally, such a person would completely understand Israeli aggression in its own self-defense, and would actually start up a, a Palestinian resistance movement fighting Yasser Arafat and, and, and his own regime and help the Israelis to do it. Uh, look, there were lots of people in Iraq who didn't share Saddam Hussein's uh, uh, fanatical um, uh, you know, uh, despotism. Yet, a lot of civilians died who, were, who might have been innocent. People who live in a country suffer the consequences of their own leadership. And I'd say they suffer it doubly so if they don't actually rise up and try and get rid of that leader. But even if they do and they fail, they are still going to suffer when they get killed by an America coming into Iraq or an America coming into Japan or an America coming into Nazi Germany. That's life. Yeah, next question. I, I, I have to follow the mic. Uh, well, my question uh, might sound a little bit off base, but it really isn't because I disagree with you a little bit. Sure. Okay. Uh, what about the status of Jerusalem? Uh, the United States Senate, I believe the Congress, voted to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. And I understand you're secular. I am a Randist. I am a libertarian, but I am not secular. When I am a Jew, and I believe that Jerusalem is all of Jerusalem belongs to the state of Israel. It is the capital, and that's my own belief, and I wanted to hear what you had to say. Thank you. Oh, I mean, I agree with you that Israel should decide what its own capital should be. And as I said, Jerusalem, just like the rest of the West Bank, was won in a war of self-defense, and therefore, unequivocally, Israel has a right to that land if it chooses to keep it, and if it chooses to establish its capital in the entire Jerusalem area, it has every right to do that. It owes no obligation to the Christians or to the Muslims or to anybody else. So I agree for secular reasons, not for religious reasons, that I believe that a state has a right to determine its own capital 
and that Israel has a right to determine Jerusalem as its capital. And again, I think the United States moving its embassy from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv was another sign of American weakness, another step towards emboldening the Arab world and the Muslim world against the United States. It just showed that the United States could be bullied by a few weak Arab countries. Uh, the guy in the back there has been uh, standing from the beginning. Yeah. Wait for the mic, because oh, we, we, okay. we've... I'll, they'll, they'll hear you fine. I'll go no, they won't. They need the mic. <laughs> Since we're in a, in a medical center, I figured I should add a little bit of uh, medical information uh, to your speech. Um, and being a graduate of Penn, I feel almost an obligation to do that. I'm actually a resident in the Department of Orthopedics next door. And let me just give you some facts, and you can interpret them on your own. Uh, since September of 2000, 52 women have given birth uh, at Israeli checkpoints. 29 of those women aborted. Since September 2000, 35 ambulance drivers have been shot and killed at checkpoints. Since September of 2000, 95 human beings have died at checkpoints, coming in and out, unfortunately unable to reach hospitals or physicians uh, to give them adequate care. Since September 2000, 735 ambulances have been shot at and destroyed at checkpoints. Sure. Your I've, rhetoric regarding terrorism um, unfortunately seems unfounded because there doesn't appear to be any data that you cite. I that cited, I did your cite, I did cite uh, 12,500. 12, um, maybe you can give us some more sure. on what you consider terrorism uh, in light of those facts. Well, I think that, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to dispute the, fa the facts that you uh, presented. I, I don't know if they're true or not, but I'll assume that they're. Uh, no, I'll assume that they're true, because I have no problem with those facts. Uh, every drop of blood shed in those incidents, and in many, many others that you didn't cite, because clearly more Palestinians have died since December 2000, or any of those dates, any date that you would pick, than Israelis, clearly more Palestinians have died. There's no question about that. Um, every drop of blood is the fault of the Palestinians themselves. Every drop of blood is the moral responsibility of the Palestinians' leaders who have brought them to the state. Every drop of blood is the responsibility of the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad suicide bombers. If you see an ambulance and the ambulance doesn't stop at a checkpoint, and you know that Palestinians have used ambulances to do uh, suicide bombings, you shoot at that ambulance, absolutely. And I completely think that that is justified. If you know that without those checkpoints, without stopping people at checkpoints and searching those ambulances, you know that a building in Tel Aviv could be blown up, you better stop them at the checkpoint and you better search them. And if anybody dies, if anybody dies, it's on the hands of Yasser Arafat. And the, Yasser Arafat has had hundreds of opportunities to renounce terrorism, to change his ways, to uh, work towards peace, and he has rejected and turned his back on every one of those because that's not what he wants. Uh, so the, the terrorism is absolutely one-sided. All of these incidents that you uh, mentioned are acts of self-defense, of Israeli self-defense. I remember not that long ago, uh, 15 years ago, there were no checkpoints in the West Bank. There were no checkpoints in the West Bank. The 12 year old kids are shot with M16s because they are placed. Well, let, let me answer that. There are some 12 year olds who do get shot by M16s. Okay. Why? Because next to them is standing a Palestinian with a Kalachnikov shooting at Israeli soldiers. It is the responsibility of the Palestinians who put 12 year old children in the line of fire on purpose so they will die while the TV cameras are rolling so that the West will get upset. It is the responsibility of Palestinian parents who send their children out there to be killed purposefully for this purpose. That is the atrocity. The atrocity is that the Palestinians put their children in harm's way on purpose. Because they I are the terrorists. They were 12 years old and they were throwing rocks at a tank from two blocks. They were not. This is all, this is all propaganda and nonsense. 12 year old kids are not just shot. Uh, you know, because the Israelis, because an Israeli tank can't get through. This is propaganda. Uh, uh, you 
say the textbooks that the children, the Palestinian children are, are following, are, are preaching hatred for Israel. I yeah. mean, the, these young children can't, can't discern between the truth and the non-truth. Then, then the Renaissance and the, in that world is going to be a long time in coming. Absolutely. <laughs> the Renaissance in that world is going to be a long time in coming. And I think that you will see evidence of that you know, if I can make a prediction, you can always call me on it afterwards. Uh, I think that these attempts to uh, create democracy out of nowhere in Iraq right now are going to fail. They might not fail short term. We might see a few years of democracy, but long term they will fail. You cannot bring about political freedom divorced of its requirements. The West didn't get political freedom in the Middle Ages. The West didn't even get political freedom in the Renaissance. When did the West get political freedom? After the Enlightenment, after a whole generation went through a period that raised reason out of, out of where the Christians had buried it during the, the Middle Ages, raised reason and put it on its pedestal, as Thomas Jefferson and the Founding Fathers indeed did with the founding of this country. That's what made freedom possible in the West. And for the Islamic world to become free, political free, which I hope they do one day, they need to go through an enlightenment. They need to go through a rebirth of reason. Reason which once was prevalent in the Middle East during the 9th and 13th century when they had their golden age, but has since been lost and has since been buried by their own Islamic fundamentalists, just like the Christian fundamentalists in, in the Dark Ages buried reason for Christianity's sake. Uh, the Muslim fundamentalists have buried reason for Islamic, for, for, the, for the Muslims sake for the last, what, 700 years? It's going to take a lot more than a few Marines to establish democracy in a country like Iraq with all the best, you know, the best wishes and best efforts that we can have. You need to change the underlying ideology, the underlying philosophy of that entire region. They have to accept, as I said in my talk, Western values of reason and individual rights in order to, find, to found a uh, you know truly free countries and note that even in the West today we don't respect reason and individual rights. So how do we expect anybody else to have any respect for them? So it's going to be a long time. Is the quick answer. Um, some reports have it that Arafat is one of the world's two or three hundred richest men, with a fortune <laughs> in the billions pilfered from the coffers of both the European Union and America. How do you believe uh, we should go about? this whole issue of Arafat and the money that he's taken for his own gain? That's a good question, because I was, I was quite, I didn't know the details of this, but I, I just, uh, I think it was three or four weeks ago, uh, Forbes magazine ran the 400 richest people, and they had a little box about Yasser Arafat, and according to Forbes, they, they estimate his wealth at, as, at a minimum, I think it was $300 million. Okay. How do you get $300 million? as the head of the Palestinian Authority, if you're not either getting paid for killing people by somebody, or you're not stealing it off of the money that's supposed to go to your people. There's no other way to do it. He hasn't produced anything. There's no Palestinian Microsoft that Yasser Arafat is the head of and therefore made a lot of money. He hasn't created any wealth. He has not been productive in that sense. So he's stealing it and has been stealing it or getting paid again for the terrorism that he's engaged in for the last what is it, almost 40 years now. So what we, should we do with Yasser Arafat? Well, I think we should do with, what, with Yasser Arafat what the Israelis have wanted to do to Yasser Arafat for the last 40 years. I think it is a mistake to talk about kicking him out of the West Bank and sending him to some Arab country. He's been in another Arab country, in Tunisia, for many, many years and, and created havoc from there. The only thing that can be done with Yasser Arafat, the only just thing, the thing that justice requires, is to arrest him, try him, and hang him publicly for the world to see what is done with terrorists. So nobody should ever mistake what the West will do when it catches terrorists. I mean, there's no difference here between what the Israelis did to Eichmann in 1960 and what they should do with Yasser Arafat. It's exactly the same. And they should make a public trial out of it to show all of his crimes and why this is the only just thing that should be done. I remember reading shortly after the Six-Day War, um, 
Somebody had written, when in the history of the world have the losers dictated the prospects for peace, uh, except for this particular situation? I thought it was very well put. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say uh, is I was visiting friends on a kibbutz when they had a terrorist infiltration. And I understand what that fear is like. It's the most incredible thing that I've ever experienced, and I don't really wish to ever do it again. But if these people have to live with this on a daily basis, my hearts go out to them. My question, though, is um, why is Jordan not considered a Palestinian state? I've never really understood that as I would like to. So why is Jordan not considered a Palestinian state? Before I say that, let me just say I agree with you completely, having lived in Israel most, or most of my early life. Uh, I know what it's like to go through when terrorists infiltrate and, and so on, and that's the reason why we, they have the checkpoints in the West Bank. It's, why the, it's the reason why people are dying at the checkpoints, because Israel has to protect itself. He's gone. Um, as with regard to Jordan, look, Jordan should be a free country. It should not be ruled by a king or any other despot. And the fact is that ethnically, most of the population, well over 50% of the population of Jordan, is Palestinian. And I think Jordan should be open to accepting more people who would want to move there. And if it, if it was free, it would, in a sense, become the Palestinian state. The only reason Jordan is not a Palestinian state is because a long, long time ago, the British promised it to the Faisal family because they made a mistake after, during World War I. They promised Saudi Arabia to two different families to the Saud family, which rules it today, and to the Faisal family. And as a consequence, they had to give these guys something else. And they gave them, for, you know, just a little history, they gave them Jordan, King Abdullah, and then they gave them Syria. And the Syrians didn't like the Saudi Arabian coming to rule over them, and they kind of kicked him out. So you know what they did with him? They made him king of Iraq. And he was king of Iraq until the early 1950s. So, you know, the only reason Jordan is a Hashemite empire and not a, um, and not a, um, a you know, a, a Palestinian state is because the British gave it to the Hashemites, gave it to a particular tribe in Saudi Arabia, which actually, who actually ruled over Mecca and Medina, the holy cities of Saudi Arabia, when, you know, when the Sauds kicked them out. So it's history. And, you know, there's no reason. It should be a Palestinian state. Oh, no, because nobody, nobody talks about history. We don't know history. We ignore history. History is unimportant. The only thing that we care about is, you know, is how do we get by tomorrow? How do we survive tomorrow? How do we cut the, ne the next shortcut that we can tomorrow? And, and you know, our school system lacks history education. Our universities don't really teach history. You know, the, the Middle East is in bad shape, but so is this country. I wanted to ask you a fundamental question. You talked about collectivism and individual rights. And yet it seems to me that in the Iraq war, we saw 20-year-old 20, 20 American soldiers dying. And I think in some cases, they said, for something greater than themselves. This has certainly been the history of the Israeli state since 1948 and before, that young men and older men and women have died for something greater than themselves. And on the other hand, you have laissez-faire capitalism, you have the Carlyle Group, which regularly trades with Saudi Arabia, a source of terrorism throughout the world. You have the recent Yossi Ginnisar stick scandal in Israel. And I'm wondering how you can justify, and I, and I do love your defense <laughs> of Israel, but how you justify the laissez-faire individual capitalism, given the fact, it seems to me, that it is this collective identification uh, with either America or, in my case, I, I consider myself a religious Jew, the identification with the Jewish people that gave rise to Israel. And it seems to me that there is an element of validity to a collectivist view. Okay. Why do soldiers go into battle? And why is it from a purely individualistic, selfish, egoistic perspective that they are willing to risk their lives for their country. Why is that? Well, first of all, they don't always do it for the right reason. Many people go to battle for the wrong reason. And they do it for collectivistic reasons, uh, which I think are the wrong reasons. Uh, and they do it, and, you know, and, and in many places in America and in the United States, many of the soldiers indeed do it for collectivism, and I think that's wrong. How could I justify it from an egoistic 
perspective. I like the Marines, I like, you know, I, I watched before the Iraq war as the Marines were being interviewed. And when they were asked, why are you fighting? Anybody remember what they said? They said, I'm fighting for my kids. I'm fighting for my wife. I'm fighting for my family. I'm fighting so for my kids won't have to live in a world where Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. Now, to me, that is egoism. They are fighting for the values, the people in this case, the values that they view as the most important values in their lives, their kids, their wives, their close family. And I think if you took it to a more abstract level, if these were slightly more intellectual soldiers, as I wish they were and hope one day they will be, they would say, I'm fighting because in a world that has weapons of mass destruction in the hands of despot, that is a world I do not want to live in. That is a world that I can't go into a mall without thinking whether it would be blown up or not. That is a world in which my life is not worth anything. That is a world in which my freedom is not worth anything. I am fighting for my life. I am fighting to be able to be free. I am fighting for my values, for the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Not everybody's right to the life, liberty, mine. But of course, mine involves everybody's. If I'm going to fight for mine, I'm going to fight for everybody's because it would be meaningful just to fight for mine. So I think there are plenty of rational soldiers out there who maybe can't articulate it, but who are complete egoists or who are in Iraq because they understand that Iraq poses a threat to them, to them and the things that they hold dear, including these abstract values that maybe they can't put words to, but you know, neither can our intellectuals. Uh, but that's what's behind uh, what they say. They are fighting for the American way. You know, for, for, that's what they mean. They're fighting for freedom. And, and you could say, look, I would rather commit suicide, in a sense, than live under a Nazi dictatorship. That is the selfish thing to do. Well, I would certainly fight against a Nazi dictatorship and risk my life, then live under it. And for that matter, I would be willing to fight and risk my life daily to prevent militant Muslims who would blow themselves up in a second from possessing nuclear weapons or chemical weapons or other types of weapons. So when there is a real threat to their values, it's completely egoistic to fight for them. Collectivism, on the other hand, is what leads Nazis to fight for Nazism. It's what leads Aryans to fight for the Aryan nation. It's what leads uh, you know, Christians to go on a crusade, and it's what leads Osama bin Laden to go on a Muslim crusade against the West. It is those feelings of doing it for the, you know, some greater good other than oneself that can only, that's the only way you could explain the kind of suicide missions that Muslim fundamentalists in, are involved in. Okay? Collectivism as the principle defining the reason one fights has always led to complete and utter disaster. And I believe that even in Israel, to the extent that they fight for purely collectivistic reasons, that, they, that weakens them and ultimately will lead to their destruction. And the more they move towards an individualistic society where the Israeli soldier can say proudly that he is fighting for his values, for freedom, for individual rights, for capitalism, the, the better the soldier will be and the healthier Israeli society will be and the longer it will survive. at Community College of Philadelphia. And uh, last week we had a, a guest lecturer from Penn, uh, Professor uh, Ian Lustig, uh, who uh, informed an audience that uh, the United States Congress is controlled by the Israel lobby, uh, it compared Israel to a uh, drug addict, and it, it kind of went downhill from there. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, some, uh, some enraged students started uh, talking about their claims that uh, there never was a Jewish temple in Jerusalem, and it, it became more interesting after that. Uh, what I'm interested in is the kind of the general political tone being set uh, from the White House uh, since at least June 24th of last year, uh, when the president has started using uh, words like occupation and settlement uh, on a, a consistent basis. Uh, one never hears about the uh, Polish occupation of Silesia and Pomerania and East Prussia. 
uh, or uh, about settlements. Uh, and I, it seems that that kind of rhetoric uh, has the effect of delegitimizing the, the state of Israel as a whole. Uh, now, when I uh, discuss this with my uh, conservative Jewish friends, they say, uh, they, they wink and they say, don't, don't worry, he's just saying that, but he, actually the White House has so many conditions on the, the Palestinian state that they'll never be able to achieve it, and it's, it's, it's not a, a realistic concern, but yet one hears about the timetable that by 2005 there will be a state come hell or high water. So uh, are, are, are these people right? Is, is, the, is the White House being too clever? Well, let me put it this way. Even if the White House is being clever here, they're making a fateful mistake a mistake which we will pay the consequences. As I said in my talk, whenever they appease terrorism, whenever they appease the terrorists, even in words, not in actions, they are emboldening the terrorists. Every day that George Bush goes out there talking about the roadmap, some junior bin Laden is gaining strength. Some young terrorist is saying, wow, if only we can survive long enough, if only we can make our claims strong enough, if only we can kill enough people, they will ultimately listen to us and they will give us, uh, they will give us something. Uh, but let me say that I don't believe it's just a game. I believe that this administration really wants to solve, they want a Palestinian state, they want to solve this problem. And, and I think this is, administration is a bizarre combination of some very good stuff and some very, very bad stuff. You know? They've done some good stuff since September 11th and they've done some awful stuff since September 11th. They've, they've gone to war, which you know, I think is a good thing, and then they've executed a war which, in a way which I think sends the wrong messages to, to the world. You know, everything they do is, 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 is this um, mixed bag of contradictions. And I think as a consequence, they're not really winning the war. I think it's this contradiction that prevents them from winning it. For example, uh, this administration fears in my view, naming the enemy on the war on terrorism, which isn't terrorism. I mean, that's a joke. There, there are lots of terrorists around the world that we're not at war with. We're at war with one group of terrorism, and indeed, it's not even a war against terrorism. It's a war against an ideology that is using terrorism right now as a tactic, might use other techniques in the future, like all-out war, just, just plain old war. The war is against militant Islam. That is the ideology that is attacking us. That is the ideology that preaches our destruction. And that is the ideology that sends these terrorists out to, to suicide mission. Why won't they say it? Why won't they say it? How can you fight a war when you're afraid to name the enemy? Imagine fighting World War II without saying, we, we want to destroy Nazism. You know? Instead of that, we're saying, we just want to capture Hitler and a few of his leaders. We'll kill them. But, uh, and, uh, and we don't hate the German people, we like the German people, they're okay. And indeed, moderate forms of Nazism are okay. It's just the extreme form that, you know, we don't like, but we're not at war with even that. We're not at war with it. Okay. That's the equivalent. You, you know, project that on, on Japanese uh, imperialism on any form. You cannot fight a war like that. And indeed, I think, I think we're not. I, I think our war in Afghanistan what was, was a pathetic example of a war, and, and indeed I think we, we did not achieve any of our real targets other than doing away with the Taliban regime. You know, uh, we didn't get the major terrorists out of that war, and I think even the war in Iraq is going to come back to haunt us, we did, because we, we fought what I consider a compassionate war. And I think it's a moral abomination, and going back to the uh, ambulance uh, question. It is a moral abomination for one Marine to die because we would not kill civilians. One American to shed blood because we didn't let the helicopters fire from far enough because we weren't sure if it was a civilian target or not. One Marine to die because we wouldn't shoot at a mosque. Do you know what they did last week at a mosque, the three Shiite spiritual leaders? Well, one of them slaughtered the other two. They were butchered in a mosque, not just in a mosque, in the holiest mosque to the Shiite religion. There was blood shed on the floor. And we won't shoot at a mosque and a Marine dies? I mean, that to me is a moral atrocity of this administration. For what? What are we doing this for? To 
to make the Arab street love us? You think they're gonna love us because we only killed a thousand civilians and not two thousand civilians? Of course not. If anything, they lose respect for us because we don't fight a war the way wars are supposed to be fought. There's no such thing, by the way, as MSNBC and C-SPAN, all these, uh, not C-SPAN, as MSNBC and CNN and Fox say, there's no such thing as the rules of law, of war. War is the negation of rules. It is the, it is the, it is the reversion to pure brutality. There's no such thing as acting nice in a war. That's a complete denial of what war is about. War is about killing people. There's no way to kill them nicely. There's no way to execute a war with compassion. And when you do, you send, again, the wrong message to the rest of the world. You send the message of moral weakness and cowardice. And I think that we are going to suffer the consequences of sending such messages into the decades to come. That man in the back has been patiently waiting to ask a question for a long time. Thank you very much. I, I, without uh, arguing uh, much uh, of your presentation, because I, I firmly believe in a strong moral case for Israel, and you, and you made much of it, and perhaps I did miss this at the beginning because unfortunately I was late, but could you comment uh, about the following? Uh, the, the fact is that uh, whatever we feel about uh, a Palestinian state, uh, many in Israel, many Israelis find great difficulty in fulfilling their humanity, their rights, their Ayn Rand principles uh, of, of, of self-respect and what they're about in ruling over a, a million people who don't want to be ruled over by them. Now, I certainly agree with you. Uh, I, I'm sure I don't know the depth of the history, but uh, Jordan didn't want them either. I know that. Uh, and Israel tried to give them to Jordan. But the fact is that why is Israel willing to, to negotiate, to talk, to try to make some kind of compromise is because they don't want to rule over these people. Uh, I, I would also just like to comment, because... Uh, I, I recall very well, I believe I was in, in Israel uh, at the time of that uh, uh, killing of the, of the terrorist leader, which certainly was an admirable end, and one which I would, uh, under circumstances, have to support. But uh, at the same time, it, it, it was more than just collateral damage that 14 civilians were killed. It was obviously known that civilians were going to be killed because of where he was and the amount of uh, ammunition that was dropped on him. And I think that was the criticism, not killing this, this man, but when there perhaps were other opportunities or other ways, or maybe that opportunity should have been missed. But anyway, I'd like to get back to that as part of that whole context, namely the, the individual within Israel that wants to retain uh, whether, you know, this lecture is, is part of that or not, but wants to retain the Jewishness of the Jewish state and, and their sense of also being a free Western thinking individual who doesn't want to rule sure. over people who do not want to be ruled over by him. Sure. Let me, let me start by commenting on your, on your second comment and then I'll get to the broader question. Um, if Israel had been able to kill Shadeda, they would have done it previously. That is, he's been on the, on the top, he was at the time at the top of their target list for, for years and they were not successful. And I would argue, and, and I know that's, this sounds inhumane and, and, and so on, but I think it, it indeed is humane, that even if 100 people would have died, and Israel would have known that 100 people would have died, it would have been justified. Or 1,000 people, it would have been justified. The fact is that, it, that when Israel is tough, when Israel is strong, they don't come back. It's when Israel is weak and, and leaves the territories, it's when they come back. When we held those territories, when we were tough with them, they did not attack Israel. They, uh, they are emboldened by Israel's weakness, just like Osama bin Laden is emboldened by America's weakness. And when Israel apologized for killing the 14 civilians, it again emboldened them, because now they know that if they surround themselves with women and children, if they drive everywhere with women and children, if they only walk around in crowds, Israel won't do anything to them. And indeed, Saddam Hussein, I think, has escaped because he learned that lesson. And Osama bin Laden certainly escaped Afghanistan because he learned that lesson, because he, 
according to the New York Times at least, on several occasions they knew where he was and he was surrounded by women and children and therefore they didn't attack him. So you get the, you know, evil will perpetuate itself because it has no problem using women and children to its own devices. But, you know, think back on, just to, to finish this point about civilian casualties, think back on what the United States did in World War II in order to win that war. Before Nagasaki and Hiroshima even, before the atomic bombs that killed, what, 100,000 civilians? Even, a, you know, months and months before that, the United States bombed Tokyo and every other major city in Japan, killing tens of thousands of civilians because they thought it would shorten the war. They didn't do it. It wasn't collateral damage. Oops, we missed the military target. We hit a civilian. They killed civilians because civilians became a military target because that would shorten the war and guarantee American victory. Nobody in America made a peep out of it. Nobody objected to that because we lived in a time when we had a lot more confidence in our moral righteousness. And I don't think that was wrong what we did. When we flattened Dresden in Germany, I don't think that was wrong if it saved American lives, if it led to a shorter World War II. And I think the same is true in Israel. If Israel, to kill, a, uh, a leader of a terrorist group has to kill civilians in the process, so be it. Their blood is on that terrorist leader's hands, not on the Israelis' hands. Now with regard to the broader question, there is no question that Israel supports compromise and appeasement and supports uh, dealing with the Palestinians. I mean, uh, you know, in that sense, they're often ahead of the Americans. Uh, Indeed, I believe that the biggest enemies of Israel, the, the, the most significant enemies of Israel, teach at the Haifa University and Tel Aviv University, just as I believe the, the biggest enemies of the United States teach at Penn uh, and, and other places like this. So I think Israeli intellectuals are its biggest enemy, just like American intellectuals are, it, are America's biggest enemy. They have bought into the altruistic, collectivistic philosophies that are destroying the West. And by doing so, they are going to commit suicide. Either commit suicide or lead to a much bigger war long term in the Middle East. Just as I believe that the West is committing suicide by more and more over time accepting altruism. Altruism is the idea of self-sacrifice as the moral standard. And collectivism is the idea that groups matter, not individuals, that everything should be sacrificed to the group that by adopting altruism and collectivism in the West, we are abandoning our roots in the, in the founding documents of this country, and as a consequence are committing suicide qua West. And I think Europe is a few decades ahead of the United States on the march towards the abyss, but we're not that far behind them. Right? And Israel is there with us as well. So let me put it this way. If, um, if Israel truly, if Israelis, truly believed in Ayn Rand's values, then they wouldn't like the occupation. Nobody likes an occupation. But they would recognize that occupying these people, at least for a while, and probably a long while, unfortunately, is necessary for their own survival, and therefore they would do it. And they would realize that the only way to change the Palestinians to the point where you will be able to grant them their own state maybe one day, or grant them full, full citizenship in Israel one day, is by occupying them maybe for a generation, maybe for two, and re-educating with Western values, trashing those books that they're studying with now, and replacing them with real history and real values and a respect for reason, science, and individual rights. But as I said at the end of my speech, Israel is not going to come to that conclusion. Neither we in the United States are going to come to that conclusion until we adopt reason, science, and individual rights as our motto, as the values that we are willing to fight for. And we're not. We're, you know, we have a murky perception of what democracy is, the way we're going to, we're going to bring to Iraq, where collect, all these collectives, these ethnic groups are going to be represented at the table. The founding fathers didn't talk about the Irish Americans and Italian Americans and Jewish Americans being, having a place on the table. They talked about individual rights. If we went to Iraq and preached individual rights, maybe we would have a chance. But going to Iraq and talking about Shiite rights and Kurdish rights and Sunni rights, and not only that, they're getting to the absurdity 
of, of declaring the rights of the 22nd smallest minority, you know, the Zuians, or the, you know, these tiny little groups, they all have rights because they are a group, they are a collective. So we in the West have abandoned those values. No wonder we are weak. No wonder we are committing suicide. No wonder we advocate for the Palestinians. And of course, the more collectivistic, the more altruistic we are, the more we commit suicide. I love the French. How to have one French, you know. We have time for one more question, Dr. Brooks. Go ahead. I know there's several other questions, so I'm going to let you pick. Oh, you want me to pick? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't know who had the hand up first. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, the one you're next to, I guess. I, I have no preference. Thank you for coming here today and speaking here. Um, I just had a question. You answered a little bit of that in the previous question, uh, previous question. but I'd like you to elaborate on that if you could a bit. Um, I agree with you that Yasser Arafat is not going to be a vehicle for peace, and he does need to be removed. But um, from there, you implied that Yasser Arafat equals Palestinians, and on that basis, denied the existence of a, uh, the right of a Palestinian state to exist. Now. How can you justify sealing the fate of a people based on the actions of the despots controlling them? And I mean, if, if Osama bin Laden used that kind of reasoning, and he did, and we got September 11th, you know? Um, being well, but he didn't because Osama bin Laden has no grievance against anybody. He just kills for the sake of killing. He has no justification. And if you could argue that 80% of the Palestinian people are freedom-loving, individual rights-loving, they want to live next to Israel, they want to live in peace, then I would be with you and say, let's form a coalition with those 80%, kill Arafat and the leadership, and give them one. Absolutely. But they don't. They're not that way. Can I, can I just, uh, oh, you can finish, yes. Being morally superior to Osama bin Laden, how can we resort to the same logic as he does? And what do you suggest, if, if we don't have a Palestinian state, what do you suggest we do with the Palestinians? Well, as I said, I don't think we're on the same um, all plane as, uh, universe as Osama bin Laden. Uh, indeed, because he is initiating force and we are using force in self-defense. And that puts it at the extreme opposites in terms of the morality of what we are doing. Um, now, the question was, what, should, what, are we, what are the other people within the Palestinian leadership? Let's, let's interpret it that way, the question. And then I'll, I'll go to the what should we do with the Palestinians. Look, Yasser Arafat has spent the last 35 years killing anybody who opposed his views within the Palestinian leadership. I mean, he's purged them left and right over and over again. The people today who are within the Palestinian leadership are, are Yasser Arafat cronies. Uh, so it's not like there's somebody else to take his place. And, and uh, in, indeed, this prime minister that they've uh, chosen right now is a perfect example of that. He's been a member of the PLO from the beginning. He's been a part of it as a terrorist organization from the beginning. He has supported Yasser Arafat from the beginning and throughout. He has advocated for the, for the um, uh, you know, uh, for the uh, elimination of the state of Israel qua se from the beginning. He pretends to be a peacemaker as a pragmatist, just like Yasser Arafat pretends to be a, a, a peacemaker and a practical man. He indeed wrote his dissertation uh, at, I can't remember the university, but he wrote his dissertation on uh, basically quoting Holocaust deniers. So he, you can add to that that he is an anti-Semite. Uh, I, I refer you to Jeff Jacoby wrote an excellent uh, op-ed in the Boston Globe, I think it was a week or two ago, about who this guy really is. You know, this is just another Yasser Arafat in, in sheep's clothing, that's all. There's no difference. And as I said, if it were true that the overwhelming majority of the Palestinian people were peace-loving, individual rights-loving, they would have killed Yasser Arafat a long time ago and replaced him with somebody and came to Israel with a peace plan which, you know, which was based on freedom and, and, and mutual coexistence. So what can we do with the Palestinians? Well, as I said, I believe that at least for a generation, you know, maybe sooner, I don't know, but at least for the near future, Israel has to reoccupy the West Bank and Gaza. It needs to go in there and eradicate all terrorist activity it needs to destroy the infrastructure. It needs to destroy the leaders. It needs to imprison however many it takes to stop the terrorism. And it needs to replace the textbooks. It needs to replace the teachers if necessary. It needs to change the environment within 
the Palestinian world within the West Bank and Gaza, just as it did to some extent and with some limited success in the 1970s. But unfortunately, Israel made a very big mistake in the 70s. And that was that it, in order to establish an opposition to Yasser Arafat and Palestinian nationalism, it, in, it uh, helped establish militant Islam through the Hamas movement, which Israel helped fund during the 1970s, and of course is suffering the consequences of that to this day, just like we in America funded Osama bin Laden in order to fight communism, we suffer the consequence of that bad decision to this day. So what they need is a secular, uh, pro-individual rights, pro-freedom uh, educational system in the Palestinian territories. They need to let that function for a while and see what happens. And if the Palestinians politically mature to the point to which Israel is 100% convinced that they have no intention of annihilating Israel, that they will form a truly free, uh, representational, individual rights respecting country, then I have no objection in principle under those conditions to forming a Palestinian state. But those conditions are necessary to form such a state. And until those conditions come abide, any forming of such a state is an act of suicide. So I am not very optimistic <laughs> for two reasons. I, well, for one major reason, because I don't think Israel will do it. And the reason I don't think Israel will do it is because Israel is being corrupted by bad philosophy, just like the rest of the West, as I noted. And it's, it, it, it's, it's, in a sense, more corrupt because Israelis tend to be more intellectual. And, uh, you know, the more corrupt it becomes, the more dangerous of, of a place it's going to be. And, the more, you know, but in that sense, I'm pessimistic about the West in general. And I think the only hope for the West and for Israel is, as I said, a return to reason and individual rights. And I think the only philosophy advocating consistently for reason and for individual rights is Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. So until we take over the world, things are not looking good. Thank you.